Bruce Middle is one of those rare finds, a really super talented musician who shares his knowledge with up-and-coming musicians. He's a professor at Mary Washington University where he teaches guitar, and he comes from a background where his entire family was involved in music. So he's been doing music all his life. He plays so many instruments. He is truly a gifted guitar improviser, and I'm going to interview him today on Sally Pal. I think you'll really enjoy some of the things he talks about. So stay tuned because he's going to talk about how he got started in music as well as some of the projects he's working on right now and how being in isolation has affected him and apparently hasn't affected him all that much. So stay tuned and I hope you'll enjoy this new edition of Sally Pal on YouTube. Bruce Middle, thank you so much for joining me on Sally Pal. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm really looking forward to this. So. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I've been listening to you almost all day. It's so nice to listen to your music. You are a guitarist, but you're not, it's really hard to pigeonhole you. I would say primarily jazz guitarist. Improviser, yes. It's so nice to see you. You know, you know Brian Jarbo, who is mm -hmm. my music partner, and he has been bugging me to interview you for a little while now. He's like, oh, this guy is awesome. You need to talk to him. <laughs> Thank you, but Brian. <laughs> Once I started researching you, I realized I don't know how I have been missing out on this. Thank you. Well, I can't even talk to you about everything that you do because the list is far too long. But you are a professor. You are a jazz musician. You are a recording artist. You travel. You play everywhere. You do all kinds of music from jazz to Americana to rock and roll. I mean, you play several instruments. Yes. Yes, so I do. You run the guitar program at Mary Washington University, and you have a guitar ensemble? Yes, we do have a guitar ensemble. This semester was extremely challenging, where we had our programs all set up, and our concerts all set up, and COVID happens. So it was like, okay, here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to record you playing all your parts. I'm going to send you the guide tracks, and you're going to send me these back. And then with our weekly meetings on Zoom, we'll have the collection gallery shots, but you all are playing and I'll be sending you the audio and you play along with that. There's no way to get all this stuff in sync without certain technology, so. I'm not sure if people realize that, but there's latency for musicians that just cannot be overcome. Sure, yeah, and having good quality microphones or headphones and the interface and, you know, the expense is pretty high. And then you're running the, uh, if you will, the crapshoot on the internet because you might be able to run a nice 300 megabits of data back and forth, but the person you're connected to is only getting 100. So <laughs> you have so much experience and you also are a composer. I'd like to talk to you about what kind of projects you found yourself drawn to in a time when you were probably home more than you usually are. And I'm involved in several different groups and projects. You know, when we were performing, uh, one of the biggest things for me over the last oh, 10 or so years has been putting more emphasis on live performance, getting back to the true human connection and creating art, good or bad, live. <laughs> it could be an original idea. It could be something that we've been playing over the years or somebody pulls something up. We have several thousand tunes in our catalog. So, and for me, it doesn't matter what genre it is. And the folks I'm fortunate enough to play with feel the same way. So there's a nice, really wonderful camaraderie there. That's within my group. And then I'm involved with uh, other artists in town, Ralph Gordon. He's doing all original music. He's a singer songwriter. For me, it comes down to just very simple basics, a good melody, a great sense of time and the rhythm and the harmony doesn't have to be expansive. It doesn't have to be, you know, overbearing. It just has to be fundamentally supportive of what's going on in the song. Does it create the right atmosphere and that sort of thing? It's about good songs. Yeah, good stories. It comes down to the good stories. Are you finding yourself thinking musically differently than you have before this whole thing hit? I've actually had more opportunities to go back and examine things that I grew up on. I'm still teaching a lot of my students privately online, plus the classes at Mary Washington. So we just finished at Mary Washington this past week. So I really haven't had that much time to actually flesh it out. But 
you know, it's been wonderful to go back to the bluegrass roots, some of the West African music I was involved in in the late 80s. It has given me kind of a more, uh, a little more space to actually do some research and some of it on YouTube, some of it just randomly searching out music to listen to and then things that I'm reading about. You have a background of having been encouraged to listen to all kinds of music when you were growing up. So you find yourself returning to some of the childhood musical loves? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Both my parents' families were involved in music in their families. So my mom was a, um, a classically trained pianist and our church organist. As a matter of fact, she was the organist at the Alexandria Roller Rink when that was open in downtown Alexandria in the 50s and 60s. And my father got involved in the bluegrass scene in the 50s. So he had a bluegrass band that rehearsed, I don't know, it seemed like every day of the week, but it was probably maybe once or twice a week. In the spring through the fall, the weekends were filled with uh, bluegrass festivals, family picnics, gatherings, performances all over the place. Everything from bowling alleys to my first experience at the Birchmere when it was over in, um, in Shirlington in Arlington, you know, which was a little tiny restaurant uh, at that time. And now it's a big, huge concert hall. There was music playing all the time. And even though they may not have favored a lot of, you know, music that was coming out, especially in the late 60s, they encouraged you to listen to it, take note what's going on, but maybe you're not ready for this. And, you know, kind of push it off to the side in hopes that I would take a different direction. <laughs> Something, you know? something more appropriate would take root. <laughs> yes, yes. So in the house was primarily classical, bluegrass, country swing, jazz, blues, and Piedmont folk music. That's what we heard all the time. When we were going into seventh grade, got introduced to the Stones, Zeppelin, the new of the Beatles already, obviously, but really into those other blues rock bands, Pink Floyd. You're from Northern Virginia. When you go and travel, do you seek out music of the region where you are? Absolutely. When expressing the sense of time or feel and groove and this sort of thing, you can take a certain vibe that you get out of folks in New York. There's a certain energy and vibe that you get in that city. And you come back down you know, like into Baltimore, there's a different kind of vibe. And the tempos of things are moving a little bit slower, right? And you come down here and so on and so forth. So by the time you get way down south, the, it is so laid back and there's so much space. Um, <laughs> both my wife's family, and, uh, they're from the southwest and my family's from the midwest. Okay. So we have that blend. Tell me about what kind of projects are floating through your head. One of the things I want to do is go back to like the my early roots and some of the things um, I'm actually putting stuff up on YouTube because people have been encouraging me for a long time and I really haven't had time to do it. But I have an instrument that was made a couple of years earlier, the very first guitar I ever owned. And this was a gift from a friend uh, a couple of years ago. It was restored. I want to record a bunch of music on that. Between that and the mandolin and I've got my original banjo around here somewhere. The backdrop photo is actually from St. Croix. And yes, actually, the shirt I have on is uh, from St. Croix. We were there a couple years ago, uh, my wife and I. That's where we got married, and we went there for our 30th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I need green. I like green. <laughs> Basically, what I'm hearing in my head, and I've been singing a lot of this on my phone, for me, I sing everything. And then I learn how to play it. That's how I grew up doing all this stuff. And it was always sing, 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 sing. Learn every song, every melody. The chords are easy. There's only 12 <laughs> notes. You can put them together a bunch of different ways. And I thought, okay, now this is my father, okay, who's actually a brilliant musician. <laughs> he would, uh, he's like, yeah, your mom's doing all this cool stuff. And he goes, but then you can play like this. And he would go over to the piano and do things effortless. He, he has a natural gift in the ear for it. Yeah, I hear these song ideas or melodies. And as a composer, sure, my principal instrument is the guitar, but I don't always write for the guitar. I may hear things on flute. I'll hear things on the trumpet. I'll hear things 
on other orchestral instruments. I'll hear things on traditional uh, folk and non-Western instruments um, because I got exposed to that, at, like I said, in the, um, in the 80s, doing a lot of the West African music. So there's a lot of hand percussion things that I hear. And I'd like to incorporate those earlier ideas and songs just based on simple folklore and what can you do to, to mix these things together. Do you play all those instruments? Yes. I suspected you I did. did. I <laughs> won't go thinking? out and do a gig with them because no, there's people way like more talented than me that can do that. I've never been a songwriter from lyrics. Everything that I hear is driven by a melody and harmony and rhythm, those three basic components. If I happen to get together with a poet or a songwriter and we can collaborate on something, oh, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, and I have the idea of where the song is coming from and what the storyline is about. Yeah, then I start to flesh it out, and it's given a name later. There's many of them that I even joke with some of the folks in the band. I can only remember this one as, you know, Opus 351, because that was the engine that was in my 63 Galaxy that belonged to my sister. <laughs> but... <laughs> And it just happens to be a catalog number, too. So, But I couldn't quite come up with a name for it because it meant so many different things that came into this piece and was coming from different directions. Do you have someone you prefer to collaborate with? I have more fun. It's just me personally. I'm not sure about anybody else, but I like to take it out into a live situation. I want to see and feel what the energy is like coming back, you know, and how it's received. And then we'll go in and rehearse it. So, and you can ask any of the folks, even in my band, you've got this list of tunes that we're doing tonight, and you just gave them to me 20 minutes ago. We've never played these before. And it was like, guys, we've been doing this for a few years now, <laughs> more than a few. They're used to that. I get to hear what they bring to the table, which is equally as valuable. Some pieces, I'll write every single part out and count on the musicians to bring the best of their performance to it. A majority of the rest of it, though, is here's the raw roadmap, and here is the big you know, region that we're going to cover. I want you to carve as many paths as you possibly can to make this thing happen. It's fun. <laughs> that's, that's where the improvisation comes in, I'm sure. Sure. And everybody has to be on their toes to be able to pull that off. And we're all listening to each other, which, again, is like a big part of improvisational music or jazz. Listening is key. I mean, fundamentally in music, listening is key. It's an aural art form. So we have to listen to it. You got to feel the vibrations and you have to listen to it. It's just like any other conversation. We have to listen to each other and there needs to be give and take when we're on the stage playing through this piece, whether we've done it before or not. So, yes, we do bring our A game to the best of our abilities. Sometimes it's a beautiful thing, and I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes it's a total train wreck. It sounds like you would apply that to several types of music, is that it's a conversation. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Absolutely. You work with students, obviously, because you're a guitar professor, and you also do the jazz nights at the Colonial Tavern, where you hear a lot of new people show up. Are you seeing something new in the music you're hearing? Are you seeing innovation? Are you hearing musicians that you're excited about? Yes. Also plays out in the jazz jam. The whole idea behind the jazz jam was to bring people together. It's just like a blues night or a bluegrass. It is America's historically classical music. It started here. It started in New Orleans, just like the blues. And bluegrass came from the U.S. So the heritage cannot be neglected. You know, you do want to understand its history. You do want to understand where it came from. And there's so many, many different um, styles. This needs to be encompassing and embrace people who've never heard it before, who are interested in it, people who have been playing it and want to go further with it. There has You have to be encouraging. Also have some grounded foundation in it so it makes sense and there are some folks that are being innovative and there's actually folks here in town that are being innovative here in Fredericksburg there's a, a couple of groups doing that where they've taken more modern pop tunes which is basically the heritage of the bebop and the jazz era they took show tunes and turned them into this new art form 
or a new means of expression, right? And so these folks today are doing the same thing. And when you hear a Green Day tune being performed with a trumpet, a vocalist, a alto sax or a tenor sax, and drum space and keyboards, it's cool. That was very, very cool. Again, the art form is based on covering something from another artist, but making it your own and truly making it your own and using it as a template, you know, uh, which is why you can find any of the traditional and same thing, blues and jazz. You could find any of the, the standards fly me to the moon went from one particular version, then you have Sinatra, then you have this one, then you have this one, and then you have instrumental versions and there's hundreds of them. And nowadays, I think it's a blast. You've got these heavy metal bands that are playing bluegrass instruments, and they're playing it, <laughs> you know, and they're doing their own thing with it. It's like, oh, this is cool. And you got a ukulele orchestra over in the UK that's doing it like a Pink Floyd album, you know. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love that that you are passing this on to another generation. It feels like you have an enthusiasm for the art that is so necessary to engage younger musicians. What is lost from the youth where you start getting into middle school and these kids are now having to be so analytical. And I believe you did a blog on this too. The value of failure you must learn from. Right. It, it's it's always going to be good. And so the failure basically comes down to, is it me or is it the circumstances? Just try it. Just play it. Don't worry about being judged because the only people that are judging you should be yourself. If they're closed minded enough that they're going to make that kind of judgment. OK, go somewhere else. For a lot of them, they are so afraid to come out and even play And this whole idea of the jam sessions and that sort of thing. That's the idea of bringing people out to play. I've been doing the guitar ensemble at Mary Wash since 2011. Over the years, there have been pockets of people that refuse to play together. They will play as a group, as an ensemble, because it's, a, it's an extension of what they did in high school and they went through a guitar program. And it, I'm, it blows my mind. You never so much as just pick up the thing and went, hey, man, do you know this song? Let me show it to you. This is cool. Did you I, guys ever get into that? And they're going, mm, no, no. So, yeah, we have to go through this whole, you know, learning process. Well, tell me this before we wrap up. Brian actually has a, two questions for you. Okay. Do you have a favorite guitar? <laughs> out, out of my collection, I have a Gibson ES-175 I've had for decades. That, hands down, is Uno number one, as far as the electric family. A Collings uh, Soco, which is a smaller hollow body. Uh, so those are my two top electrics. My favorite acoustics... There's like four of them because they, they, they all have their own unique characteristic, you know, and it's just like those other two instruments. They all have a unique characteristic. So I and again, it comes down to things that I hear and I play differently on each one. There's things that expression wise that come out on the 175. I cannot do on any other instrument. And believe me, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I have tried. It's just the instrument. I don't know how else to explain it. And the same thing with the, the acoustics. They all have a unique characteristic. And I might play one one day or for a week or for two weeks. And other times I might play a different instrument every single day. And, you know, it, it just depends on what is going through my mind. And it's also helpful to switch it up because you get complacent on what you hear. And then you start to lose clarity on the sonic, you know, palette that's coming out of it. And you switch to another instrument and give it a day or two. And then you come back, you got fresh new ideas that come out. That was a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Am I partial to Fender PRS? Or, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't want to hurt your guitar's feelings. No, no. I don't want sad wood in the house. <laughs> no, no. He wants that. <laughs> Here's the last question. This is from Brian. Do you have a favorite Disney song? There's a couple. The 
most favorite. I actually received permission from Fane and Hillier to put it out on a record in 2004, I think it was, Alice in Wonderland. Oh. Uh, Eva, da, 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 da. So that that definitely tops the list. Someday My Prince Will Come is up there and a couple of others. I do play some of the Aristocats tunes with some folks up in, uh, in Alexandria. Well, Bruce, thank you so much. You have been a total joy. I really appreciate it. Thank you, you, Sally. I really appreciate it. Bye.